program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 85 regarding a murder. Mrs. Maud Ross was found murdered this afternoon in her home on East Avenue 28. That's all. Rose in the first. Just a pike around here at Lincoln Heights. I guess you're right. Well, I'll get it. 
I can wait. Probably some dame squawking about the guy next door burning rubbish after hours. Lincoln Heights, Detective. What? Yes? Yes? East Avenue 28? Yes. Oh, yes, ma'am. We'll be right out. Come on, Eddie. What's up? Oh, no, we're not. We're from police 
headquarters. Well, who did it? That's what we're trying to find out. Have you any idea? No. Just like I told you, I ain't seen her for years. Where were you this morning, Ross? Well, I went to work as usual. Between 8 a.m. and 10 o'clock, what were you doing? Well, I left the house here at 8 a.m. like I always do. Then where'd you go? I drove to the Yale Street Yards of the City Street Department where I reported to work. What time did you get there? About 8.15. Where did you go from there? Well, my gang was loading cement on a truck for a manhole job we was working on at 21st and Coberman. When they got it all loaded, they drove out in the truck, and I followed them in my car. What time did you get on the job? Around 9 o'clock, I guess it was. Aren't you sure? Say, I don't have to carry a stopwatch around to frame alibis. What are you guys doing? Accuse me of killing Maud? We're not accusing anybody, but we'll have to ask you to come in with us till we check your story. <laughs> Yards of the city engineering department, the officers go to question Roth, the fellow workman. Now, Pop, can you remember what time Roth arrived here yesterday? Uh, yes, he got here about 8.15, same time he always does. He says that he had his men load their truck and followed them to the job at 21st and Toberman Street. Is that right? Yes, he, he got there a few minutes after we did. And what time was that? Well, now, I don't know exactly. Uh, do you remember when Ross uh, got out to the job yesterday, Harry? Well, I ain't sure of the exact moment in the minute, but Bub Buddy was around at 9 o'clock. Around 9 o'clock. Before or after 9? Well, I can't say. Just as long as it took us to drive from here out to Toberman Street. Remember any of the circumstances about Ross yesterday morning, Pop? Uh, what do you mean, circumstances? Well, how'd he act? Any difference than usual? No, he was just... Same. He, he always acts early. Nothing unusual happened yesterday, right? Well, no, nothing that I can remember. Say, there was, was that guy he was talking to. What guy? Well, while we was loading the truck, some of the bird came up to Ross. They walked over there by the shed and talked for a few minutes. Well, what did they talk about? I couldn't hear. They were too, too, too far away, but Ross seemed sore at this guy. He cussed him plenty when he left. What did this mystery man look like? Oh, I did, did, didn't notice him particularly. He was just a guy wore a, a, a business suit. Just a guy in a business suit. Well, that's not much of a description. Did you see him, Pop? Oh, yes, I, I saw him, but, well, I didn't pay no attention to him. Did either of you ever hear Ross mention his wife? Oh, yes. <laughs> he didn't like her none. What did he say about her? Oh, he, he had it in for her. How do you know? Well, he, he used to say he hated her bad enough to kill her. He didn't love, like women anyway. He said there was no b b better than the doll. Hated his wife bad enough to kill her, eh? Well, that ought to be enough to hold him on suspicion of murder. We can't hold this guy forever on suspicion of murder, Mac. We got him in here for a week now, and nothing's turned up. I know it, but I'm convinced he killed her. Well, we got to prove that. Why, we haven't found the murder weapon yet. Well, I've had men searching the riverbed for a metal bar. Why metal? Well, it must have been a bar of metal he used. If it had been wood, there would have been some splinters around. And anyway, wood couldn't have gouged that door jam the way it was. Well, his alibi is pretty tight. Why, right, the construction job at 21st and Toberman is six miles from the scene of the crime. Six miles right across town. He'd have to do some tall traveling to get out there from the Yale Street Yards and back to Toberman and 21st in less than a half an hour. And we know the approximate times he was at both places. Well, maybe he used an airplane, but I'm convinced he did it. <laughs> to get an indictment against the man they have every reason to suspect of the murder, Detectives Romero and McBride take the results of their investigation to Deputy District Attorney James Costello. So, these are the facts in the case, Jimmy. What can we do about it? Well, boys, he's done a splendid job. But there still isn't enough evidence here to hold Ross to answer for murder. That's what I was afraid of. You didn't find any fingerprints out there? None that didn't belong to the victim or her daughter. I think it would be a good idea to look the place over again. Maybe you missed something. Okay. I'll send Ed King and Jesse Wayne along to help you. Fine. We'll go out there right away. Reinforcements.
enforced by Ed King and Jess Wynn, special investigators from the district attorney's office. Romero and McBride return to the murder house on Avenue 28, where they meet Mrs. Howard, the next-door neighbor. We want to go through Mrs. Roth's house again, Mrs. Howard. Have you the keys? Why, yes, but I don't know what you'll find there now. Why? Well, after the men were finished going through the house of fingerprints and whatnot, I cleaned it up so it could be rented again. Oh, dear. You mean to say you've changed everything around? Why, yes. Is that wrong? Oh, you should have waited until we told you to do that, Mrs. Howard. Well, I'm sorry, but I didn't know. Where did you put the stuff you cleaned out? Why, I burned it in the incinerator out there. Well, boys, that's bad. Well, anyway, you might as well take Wynn inside, Mac, and show him the layout. Ed and I'll have a look at the incinerator just for luck. You'll need it. Now, come on, Jesse. Will you uh, let us in, please, Mrs. Howard? Why, gladly. I'm awful sorry about this, Mrs. Well, I don't know about it. I guess that's the incinerator out there, Ed. Yeah, it looks like it. Ah, it's too bad she's cleaned everything up. Yeah. Not much chance of finding anything here. A lot of old bottles and cans. Well, let's poke around. Yeah, there's a piece of paper that isn't burned. What does it say? Uh, nothing. It's just an old grocery bill. And an old scrap, a half-burned doll. Hey, wait a minute. There's another scrap of paper. Looks like a piece of faded blueprint. Yeah, that's what it is. The number's here on the corner. Number 8558. Uh, I guess it doesn't mean anything, though. Wait a minute. Look at the way it's been creased. Yeah, what of it? It might have been wrapped around a long, narrow object, a bar of iron or a piece of pipe. Well, it might, but it's a pretty slender clue. Any clues worth tracking down in this case, let's check on this blueprint. While Wynn and McBride continue their close recheck of the scene of the crime, Romero and King visit the county surveyor's office in an attempt to trace the fragment of blueprint. Hello, Romero. Hello, Tommy. You know Ed King from the DA's office, don't you? Sure. How are you, Ed? Okay. Well, what you boys losing for now? Yeah, we're trying to trace the blueprint, number 8558. Can you tell us what construction it covered? Well, let's see. 8558. Ought to be in the book here. Yeah, here it is. Number 8558. Yeah, that covered the construction of some manholes in the central warehouse district between Lincoln Park and the General Hospital. That job in 1923. So far, so good. Now, here's a half burned fragment of that print. Can you tell me who it was issued to? Why, well, you're asking riddles, Romero. How should I know? Don't you keep records of who gets these blueprints? No. Well, that doesn't sound very efficient. Well, here's the way our blueprints are issued. The men working on a particular job send us a request for a print. We have a record of his name and address. And as soon as the print's delivered, we destroy that card. Why, on this manhole job, probably a hundred blueprints were issued. To get the permanent record, we'd have to take over the city hall for this one department. Yeah, but we've got to know who had this particular blueprint. Yeah, well, I'm afraid, boys, that you're out of luck. Still refusing to give up, the two detectives visit the city engineer's office, whence workmen are assigned to the various construction jobs. Well, sir, boys, what can I do for you? We're trying to trace the fellow who worked on construction job 8558. Eight five five eight. What was that? That uh, was a manhole job in the central warehouse district about three years ago. You got a record of the men who worked on it? No. You don't keep records on the personnel after the job's finished. Uh, can you imagine that, Ed? I'm not surprised. Well, listen, this is important. Will you look through your files and see if just by accident you still have the information? Okay, but I'm sure it isn't there. Well, make doubly sure. Go through the files. We'll be back later. Okay. Let's go, Ed. I want to go through Ross' car. What's on your mind? Well, I got an idea. I know what the murder weapon was. What? You know the way that piece of blueprint was folded? Like it had been wrapped around a long, thin object? Yeah. You know what a gad is? No, oh, what is it? A bar of metal about the size of a shovel handle. They use it to break up paving blocks, the same way a carpenter uses a chisel on in a bigger scale with a sledgehammer. Oh, that would make a mean weapon, wouldn't it? I'll say. And there's a full flock of them around the Yale Street yard. Roth would naturally have access to them in his work. That's why I want to look over his car. The murder weapon might still be in it. Okay, let's go. See anything like a gad under the front seat here? You got anything in the rumble? Yeah, I hear a lot of old blueprints. Look, some of them are four and five years old. Say, here's a suit of overalls. Anything on them? I uh, will see quick enough. There's a couple of suspicious-looking stains. 
Well, looks like grease to me. Might be, and again, they might not. We'll just take them in for analysis. idea of coming all the way down here to the yard. Well, we got to wait for the chemist report anyway, and there's one point in Ross' alibi I want to check on. What's that? Ross contends that he couldn't have left here at 8.30, driven to Avenue 28, committed the murder, and gotten over to 21st and Silverman by 9 o'clock. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're going to see whether he could or not. We're passing the yard now. Check the time. Okay. Well, 
Here I am, Lieutenant. Right on time. Yeah, that's fine. Now, all we want you to do is to look over the man in the show up in the next room. Tell me if the man you saw around Mrs. Ross that morning is one of them. Okay. Parade in the suspect, will you, Eddie? All right. This way, please. This is what you call a show up? Yeah. You throw these bright lights on the suspect's faces. They can't see you, but you can see them. Oh, that's so they don't bump you off after they get out, huh? Yeah, that's the general yeah, idea. Well, I don't see it. Quiet. Quiet. Here they come. Well? That's him. Heard from the left. Are you sure? Positive. All right, Sergeant. Take them back to their cells. Well, Ed, how do you say? Our friend here just identified Roth as the man whom he saw leaving the scene of the crime at a quarter to nine. <laughs> Next day, the hard work of Detectives Romero, King, Wynn, and McBride is rewarded when the grand jury indicts Harry Roth for the murder of his wife. Then McBride discovers the identity of the stranger with whom Roth had argued on the morning of his wife's death. Armed with this information, the officers question Roth again. Well, Roth, how about it? About what? You've been in the can long enough to think it over. Do you want to come clean? If you're talking about a confession, you're barking up the wrong tree. I got nothing to confess. Yeah, listen, Roth. We've got an identification of you by a man who saw you leaving your wife. I ain't got no wife. All right, then, your ex-wife's house. You were seen leaving there at 8.45 on the morning of January 17th. After, after you'd brutally murdered her with a gad which you'd rolled up in a blueprint number 8558. You guys sure are smart, ain't you? No, just thorough. Isn't it true that you were served with a subpoena for failure to contribute to the support of your child on that morning? I ain't talking. Well, we know that you were, that you had an argument with the process server and that you cursed him out of the yard. And you've expressed a bitter hatred for your wife on more than one occasion, haven't you? Sure I hate her. She got what was coming to her. And someone ought to bump the kid off, too, so that she wouldn't grow up to be like her old lady. Was that your plan, to come back and murder your daughter, too? I didn't do it, wise guy. You realize that anything you say may be used against you, Ross? That statement you just made is pretty incriminating. Yeah, well, try to hang me on it. Or any of the other nice little service you have, just try to send me up. That's exactly what we intend to do. That is exactly what the well-worked-out case developed by your police succeeded in doing. For Charles Ross was convicted of first-degree murder on June the 9th, 1926. He appealed and lost, and on October the 21st, 1927, sullen and unrepentant, he paid for his crime with his life on the grim gallows of San Quentin. Another stretched neck in memoriam to the fact that crime does not pay. Thank you, Captain Wallace. Science plays a role in police work as important as the work of a detective. Science is used even to determine which is the speediest and most economical gasoline for police cars. Rio Grande cracked gasoline has been selected more than all other brands because it is refined by the newest scientific method. Scientists of the Worldwide Sinclair Oil Organization perfected cracking, which is recognized by all authorities as the most efficient refining process known. Rio Grande, as the western unit of Sinclair Oil, has the exclusive right to make cracked gasoline by this patented cracking process. And although it costs more to manufacture, it costs you no more to buy Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Use the same gasoline specified by cities for their emergency automobiles. And enjoy police car performance in your own car. <laughs> Ships in the great Atlantic fleet of the United States Navy are lubricated by Sinclair Oil. Another year's contract has been awarded to Sinclair because the United States Navy has used Sinclair Oil year after year and has yet to find better oils at any price. For only 25 cents a quart, you can buy Sinclair Opaline Motor Oil at any service station selling Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Use the oil your Navy chooses. Calling all cars, attention all cars, the cancellation broadcast 85 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rolls and clips. <laughs> Good 
Get your copy of Calling All Cars News free at any Rio Grande service station and read about next week's true police drama.